Please join me in welcoming Lorna to the podium. It's a great honor to be the moderator of the, of the evening. Um, I don't think I've seen such a, a great enthusiastic crowd since one of the Green Party conventions to get Elizabeth into office. So it feels a bit like a lovely deja vu all over again, to quote Yogi Berra. Um, my first uh, duty in this evening's events is to introduce Adam Olson. Adam is a member of the Sarlip First Nation in Brentwood Bay, and he's a devoted husband and a loving father of two great kids. We saw one of them dancing at the Green Party Christmas event, uh, of course, last year, late last year. Adam is a former councillor in the District of Central Saanich, and he fell just a few hundred votes short in his bid to become a BC Green Party MLA in 2013. Since then, he has been the interim leader of the Green Party. He's been involved in First Nations housing issues and is a small business owner. If you check out his profile online, you'll be able to hear the presentation he gave to the National Energy Board in November, the, the National Don't Listen to Anybody Board. But I sure hope they listened to Adam because he spoke from the heart with such great passion about the history of the Saanich Peninsula, particularly Brentwood Bay, and his father's fishing background and him going out with his dad in the boat, the terrible things that have happened since then. The Energy Board should have listened to him, but we at least can because we need to be educated. We need to hear Adam's story, which is the story of the people who were here before us. He has agreed to gracefully welcome us to uh, the home territory of the Saanich people. Please welcome Adam Olson. Absolutely fantastic crowd. I had squachal halet siam nights chelacha. It's a hunt up to net sene. Chisalea seneth husseinich. Lay it with othlop ay at lungs. I just said good evening. It's wonderful to see you this evening. My traditional Coast Salish name is it's a hunt up. As I was introduced, I am Adam Olson, interim leader of the BC Green Party. I'm from the Hosanich territory and the Sartlet Village in Brentwood Bay. I had the honor this evening to hear my chief, Don Tom, tell the story of the flood here on the Saanich Peninsula, the story of a chosen few who took their canoes to the top of the mountain that we know as Mount Newton, the sacred mountain known to the Saanich people as Chlewinuch. They took their canoes there and waited the flood out, and when the waters started to recede, they became known as the emerging people, and that's what Hussainich means, the emerging people. So I ask, can you feel it? Can you feel this place emerging? I was raised to know that this was the center of the universe, that this was the place that it all began. I was raised to know Saanich as a very, very special place, a place that I was charged to love, to protect, and to be a steward of. And so Hussainich has emerged in Canada as being one of those places, one of those special places that does things just a little bit differently. And our member of parliament is here to prove that. <laughs> so, so this is the place that we live. This is the place that my father's ancestors loved and cherished and protected. 
They were the, the stewards of the fish and of the deer and of the trees and of everything that you see here. The beauty that you live in today is a beauty that was left by them. This is your inheritance, what you see here. And it is only because they had that love in their heart for this place that it is what we have today. It was a, I just got a text. <laughs> it's, it's okay, yeah, it's my, it's okay, I'll deal with it after. Um, so when I was a young man, I was, I'm, I'm a mixed blooded guy, and when I was a young man, I went to visit my grandmother. And she married a, a mixed blooded guy, and I'm certain that she knew the condition that I had of confusion and of searching and longing to be part of a place. And she gave me a mission. And standing here today is, is part of the mission that she gave me, and I hope to fulfill the rest of that mission in the future. She asked me to be a bridge, a bridge across those cultures, which, which I am. And I know that there's a lot of mixed-blooded people in the room, and in fact, we all are. And we can all be that bridge across the cultures that we are. But in Canada and in this place, this is a, an interesting bridge <laughs> to, be a, to be. And she wanted me to to pass along to, to everybody when I do these kind of events, to pass along that responsibility, the responsibility that the Hosanich people had for, for being caretakers of this territory. And she wanted me to share that responsibility with the people that I talk to and the people that I visit. She wanted you to have the same responsibility, the same level of accountability for this place that the Hosanich people had when, when they were emerging from from that flood, the place that they loved and cherished. They, she wanted you to love and cherish it as well and to be a defender of it. And so I ask that you do that going forward, that the best way that you can honor the place that you're in is to defend it and to love it and to cherish it. One of the things that, that I have learned over the last few years is that the values that my grandparents had and the values that my ancestors had are very much the values that we share as a political entity, the values of participation and participatory democracy, of sustainability, social justice, respect for diversity, ecological wisdom, and nonviolence. These are all things that I was raised with. These are all values that we as Coast Salish people cherish. And it is a great honor to be here this evening to speak to this wonderful crowd, to share this, this job that we have together. And I really look forward to hearing our former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Joe Clark. And I thank you, Elizabeth, for giving me the opportunity to share this special task that we all have. Thank you. Hi, Squa. Thanks so much, Adam Olson. Most of you already know Elizabeth May as the head of the Green Party in Canada and as the MP for Saanich Gulf Islands. I know many of you are familiar with her because she comes to her riding very frequently and holds town hall meetings to hear what your concerns are. You can learn a lot more about her if you go to the uh, Green Party website, which has a, a list, a long list of her accomplishments. I'll just mention a few here. A graduate of Dalhousie Law School, the author of eight books, including her most recent, Who Are We? Reflections on My Life and Canada. The recipient of three honorary doctorates and another one coming up in May. I know it's a secret where it's coming from. They don't announce that until February or March. She's an officer of the Order of Canada. She was named by Newsweek in 2011 as one of the Earth's most influential women. 
women. And in my poetic way, I can't help but think if we listened hard enough and could understand the earth's tongue, the earth itself would agree with that assessment. Until I read Elizabeth's book, I didn't realize how long she's been at it. Her mother was an activist, and I'm sure there were many interesting dinner table conversations, but one of them must have been about the effects of nuclear testing and nuclear fallout, because when Elizabeth was in kindergarten, she told her classmates not to lick the snow because it was laced with strontium-90. <laughs> Even then, she was saving lives or at least brain cells. As a teenager, she led a successful campaign to prevent insecticide spraying on the forests of Cape Breton, where her family owned and ran a restaurant and where Elizabeth worked. And she has carried her passion for the environment and her belief that people together can make a change well into her adult life, most recently into her leadership of the Green Party and what a fine leader she has been. In spite of the confrontational nature of party politics, and we all know it's getting worse, not better, her colleagues, who don't all share her aspirations, have recognized her conviction and her talents. Since her journey to Ottawa in 2011, she has been honored with three awards from her colleagues. I think this is quite stunning. Every year she's been there, she's received a major award. The first one, 2012, the Parliamentarian of the Year. 2013, the Hardest Working MP. And last year, the Best Orator. <laughs> Have I said already that she's my politician? <laughs> and she's one who gives me great hope. In the introduction to her latest book, Elizabeth writes, we have no time for pessimists. We are out of time for procrastination. We really only have one way forward, to become active and save ourselves. And to do that, it helps to know who we are. Adam has given us one version of who we are. Part of knowing who we are in Elizabeth's view is to provide the opportunity for those of us who live in her riding to hear such people of stature and wisdom as the Right Honorable Joe Clark. I give you now the esteemed Elizabeth May to introduce the esteemed Joe Clark. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, no, you don't need to be doing. Oh, no. Oh, well, you're so sweet. Well, the thing is, this is a. <laughs> Thank you. I love you, too. Thank you. And at this rate, by the time we finish the introductions, Joe's going to want to go home. And I, have to, and I asked Maureen McTeer, by the way, a spectacular woman of accomplishment in her own right, I could introduce Joe as husband of Maureen McTeer, and that would be worth a standing ovation. But Maureen, I leaned over to Maureen before this and said, oh, um, is there anything particular you think Joe would want me to say in the introduction? Because, of course, I neglected to ask when I had a chance. She said, no, just keep it short. Um, <laughs> So here we have, you know, the titles, the honorifics, um, and awards, by the way. My awards, like these, where me members of parliament, oh, I, spotting, I, we've been remiss. We have also with us tonight the only, but, not, but soon to be not the only, Green Party member of the legislature in the BC legislature, Dr. Andrea Weaver, if you just want to say hi. <laughs> Gotta say, I'm going to keep going to get these awards from my colleagues. I'm going to keep at it until I win Miss Congeniality. I, 
I think this year I've got a shot. I know I've got hardest working MP, absolutely nailed, but I'm going to keep going. Anyway, I've, I had the great honor and privilege to have first met Joe Clark. He's the first prime minister I ever met, and I was a sort of trembling teenager with a brief against nuclear energy, which I wanted to hand to him in a snowy parking lot in Sydney, Cape Breton, the other Sydney, my parallel life on the other side of the universe. And I wanted to have a chance to speak with him, and you were so kind, and you stopped and talked to me. And, and then, when he became prime minister, in 1979, he instituted the one and only ever national inquiry into nuclear power. Of course, it, it unfortunately died when his government fell. He also appointed the most spectacular environment minister the country's ever had, John Fraser, who was a strong conservationist and a great activist in his own right, and he put acid rain on the agenda. I was watching Joe Clark's administration from a small village on Cape Breton Island and thinking, this is fantastic. This guy, this guy, Joe Clark, he's a wonderful environmentalist. And then, of course, a great environmental budget. He brought in a gas tax. And unfortunately, that was the moment when uh, my, I ran, you know I ran for parliament against Alan McCacken. That was revenge for what he did to you. Alan McCacken, <laughs> deputy prime minister uh, under Trudeau, and that was their clever coup de grace and the end of a very, very good thousand days that we had. There are people who have the honorific of honorable, and there are those who have served as prime minister who have, in Canada's lexicon, the most significant connotation and respect in the, in the term, the right honorable. We've had prime ministers who didn't deserve the designation, but the man I'm about to introduce to you deserves it in spades. We are honored to welcome to the stage tonight the right honorable Joe Clark. I just told Elizabeth that I uh, stayed off stage just a little bit longer so that my ovation would outlast hers. <laughs> <laughs> As you can probably already tell from my initial croaking up here, this will not be my usual uh, barn-burning speech. Uh, I uh, contracted a uh, throat, a cold on the way uh, uh, here, um, and... Uh, have so far survived it. One of the great uh, attributes of my life, as all of you know, is uh, my wife Maureen, uh, not simply because of her own qualities, but because we've been through this before. Once when I was running for the leadership of my party decades ago, centuries ago, <laughs> we arrived in Estevan, Saskatchewan, <clears throat> and my voice was about like this and petered out in the middle of my remarks. But Maureen had heard the damn thing so many times. <laughs> and that's one of the few places where I actually want to delegate in that, uh, <laughs> in that campaign. Before I get into other things I wanted to say, let me simply say to you, Lauren, how impressed I was by, by what you said. And it confirms a view that uh, has been gathering in my understanding of what we can be as a country about the wisdom upon which we can draw from our original peoples. Uh, I chaired, as you will recall, uh, the Charlottetown Constitutional Accords. Uh, many of you in British Columbia will remember that because so many of you voted against it when it, uh, <laughs> when it came to a referendum. Uh, but I will always remember that in a difficult time when we were beginning those discussions, which caused so many people to have to give ground that they held fiercely. The, the words that lifted us up and moved us forward were from a chief uh, from the Kootenay Plain in my own province, uh, Peter O'Chis, who said, let us lift each other up, which it has always seemed to me to be the, a, uh, a, a theme we should uh, recognize and follow in our country. I'm delighted, of course, to be here with, uh, with Elizabeth. 
Um, I understand why she was watching Parliament so closely because we had an earlier conversation. She said that was during a period in her life when she was locked in Cape Breton with only access to a CBC television and there was nothing else that she could do. But, <laughs> but I appreciate that. But it is not longevity, the longevity of our association that makes me honored to be here uh, with her. I am not surprised that she has been designated so regularly as the most effective of Canada's parliamentarians because as someone who had the privilege of serving there a long time myself, there is no doubt that that is what she is. And what impresses me most about it is not simply that she is effective in Parliament, but she is respectful of Parliament and of the others who are there. So I'm very, uh, very pleased to be with you. You understand the strict circumstances under which I'm here, and I'll get to some of those later, very much later in my remarks. I also want to thank everyone here from Alberta. Uh, <laughs> and a few who aren't, one of whom is a transplanted Ontarian who was immensely helpful to me in my life and who's here tonight, and that's the very distinguished Canadian photographer Ted Grant, who I understand is, uh, is in the audience. Now I'm going to get serious. Oh, before I get serious, let me tell you about a... Uh, uh, some this is a story some of you might heard bef have heard before because my, my speeches are so dull that I uh, usually have to warm up an audience before, it, uh, the before they begin. <laughs> And this is an apocryphal story, if you choose, about uh, an international conference that occurred in South America, not recently and not in Lima. I want to be sure you understand, uh, Elizabeth. I led the Canadian delegation to the Uruguay round of trade negotiations uh, in Montevideo, Uruguay. And uh, like all important uh, Canadian, all important international conferences, this one began with a cocktail party. <laughs> and there was a particular minister, I won't name the country, I won't even mention the gender, uh, who had been getting ready for this cocktail party all day. <laughs> and was in pretty good shape when, <laughs> when, finally, when he finally hove into the room. And as the music went up and the lights went down, he looked across the hall and he saw what he described as a vision in red. And he made his way to the vision in red and said, will you dance with me? And this vision said to him, no, and for three reasons. One, I don't dance. Second, that music, that music is our national anthem. <laughs> And third, I am the Archbishop of Montevideo. <laughs> now, you won't enjoy any part of the evening as much as you did uh, that, but let me go on. This is a uh, threatening time in our world. Russia in Ukraine, Boko Haram in Nigeria and now in Cameroon, the attacks in Paris, and the apparent velocity with which radical and lethal movements can recruit and mobilize people looking for a cause. The tragedy of Ebola's rapid spread, the looming crises of sustainability, the highly trained brutality of the self-described Islamic State recalls that wars once had their own rules, sometimes broken, but setting a framework even for conflict. The Red Cross, Red Crescent, were once treated regularly as neutrals in conflict zones. As in other circumstances, was the United Nations or organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières. Now, 
too often, they are primary targets, as are journalists. This practice of attacking the neutral or the innocent is becoming more common. Each of those events from today's headlines is deeply troubling in itself, but all have wider implications and can prove contagious. So we, cha we face challenges that take new forms and require new responses. Of course, we should not exaggerate Canada's capacity to shape those new responses, but neither should we underestimate what we can do. And the we in question is not just governments. It is also emphatically Canadian citizens and organizations and brave medical personnel and scientists, as Winnipeg's vaccine against Ebola proved. And we should not forget the importance of our own will to make a difference. That is what is critical. We need to remember, as we look at this troubling world, that in fact, this is not the most threatening time our world has faced. And we should be conscious of the progress we have made and the ways we have faced and surmounted past threats. I grew up in Cold War Canada, where serious people and serious governments built bomb shelters because they expected nuclear attack. The central policy of the then superpowers was called Mutual Assured Destruction. The acronym was MAD, MAD. And that Cold War ended. And it ended in part because the mutual threat of force came to be accompanied by a mutual determination to build and find common ground. The phrase that marked that final agreement among deep adversaries was three simple words, trust but verify. About 25 years ago next month, I had the privilege as Canada's foreign minister of hosting in Ottawa the first joint meeting in history of foreign ministers of the nations of the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Alliance, and of NATO, the Western Alliance. We agreed on a concept called open skies. Each side could fly unarmed planes freely over all the territory of the other side to see and record what was happening with military installations. And because we had come together, these former fierce adversaries, and looking above, because we were suddenly free to look above, our traditional trenches, the larger opportunity arose at that conference, an opportunity to unite into one country, the two Germanys, East and West, which the Berlin Wall had divided. Nelson Mandela grew up in a South Africa where he was denied dignity and equality because he was black. And in time, and with the commitment and optimism and support of others, including Canada, he was freed and he was elected and he set a new standard of foresight and humanity and of human generosity. I had the privilege of attending a meeting that Mr. Mandela, uh, with Mr. Mandela, weeks, literally weeks after he had come out of prison. The meeting was in Lusaka, Zambia. He was meeting in Lusaka with members of the African National Congress who had fought, and in many cases, their, com their compatriots, their comrades had died in defense of what he was seeking to do. And when he came into the room, it was a small meeting. I had been the chair of the Commonwealth Committee of Foreign Ministers leading the fight against apartheid and so was invited to come to this particular meeting. There were not many of us there, uh, maybe a hundred. And many of them, as I say, had been grizzled veterans of that very bitter, bitter conflict. And he came in and one of those veterans, after he spoke, asked him a question uh, that was highly critical of the Afrikaans who had imprisoned him. And his response was, we have to understand how difficult all this is for them. And I thought what extraordinary generosity for a man who had been, had had so much of the best years of his life 
could find in, uh, in prison. Malala Yousafzai was shot because, because she is a girl and she believes in education. And she has been awarded the Nobel Prize and is a beacon to others of courage under pressure. So, we are here tonight as citizens of a world where positive change can happen and does happen. A world where Mandela and Malala and we can make a difference. The pretense of my being here tonight is uh, to talk about my wonderful book, and those of you I know who haven't bought it, I can hardly wait till I finish speaking so you can run out and buy uh, <laughs> several, uh, several copies. Um, I'm going to uh, very briefly skim uh, what was said in that book for those of you who don't yet have it memorized. Uh, <laughs> I regard the book, I wrote the book, to be aspirational, to be Canadian, to be forward-looking. Aspirational, about what Canadian foreign policy could be. Canadian to reflect and project Canada's distinct assets and identity. I make the case that our so-called so hard power assets, resource wealth, a strong economy, a respected military, are critical to us, of course, going forward. But they are not as unique as they were before. If one looks at simply at the economy, for example, Canada became a member of the Group of Seven, the group that then sat in the cockpit of international decision making, uh, because there was one solid reason we became. There were seven people, there were seven countries. We had, at the time, the seventh largest GDP in the world, so we were invited. However well we do economically, the reality in this modern world is that our GDP will never again be the seventh largest in the world. That is not because necessarily we are failing, it is because the world is changing. So those assets will be important to us naturally, but it is increasingly our soft power assets which will distinguish and define Canada's international impact. Those include our capacity to manage and respect diversity. Our, respect, our, our reputation for a simple quality like fairness, and to go back to your, your comments, our capacity to bridge differences. Our multilateral instinct and skill. We're among the countries who have had great influence because when nations or others gather to decide issues around a table, we don't insist on being the head of the table. What's important to us is what the table decides, not who sits at the head. And the, uh, that capacity to make others agree, to find common ground, is essential more so than, uh, than ever. I think those soft power capacities are as valuable to Canada as our natural resource wealth, and we should give them much more priority than they do today. And I argue that we should be forward-looking. Uh, at my age, it's hard not to have a high respect for the past. <laughs> but there's no question that we have to take account of the profound changes that have occurred in international relations, and to recognize what we need, do, need to do and what we can do to inch steadily towards a more just and peaceful world. My thesis about how Canada became to gather influence in the world is roughly this. The Fathers of Confederation had no idea about international matters. International matters to them were the province next door, uh, the most leading uh, public servant of his time back in the, in the early 1900s described foreign policy about being about being what happened at the fence lines. Well, there are no fence lines anymore. Uh, that is a, a, uh, a very different age. We had no aspiration uh, to be anything more than a country that worked. But international Canada, for reasons you can read all about here, 
International Canada came of age after the Second World War because the world, most of the world was in rubble, but, also, but principally the countries that were in rubble were the countries that had historically taken the lead in change. Most of Europe could no longer do that. Parts of Asia that soon became uh, influential could not do that. There were a few countries that could. One, of course, was the United States. Uh, another was us. And we developed in that period of time the will and the talent to help shape the new world that formed after the Second World War, the new world of the United Nations, of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, of, of the North Atlantic Treaty uh, uh, Organization, and a rate of the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth transforming uh, to become uh, away from the, the empire. It's very interesting if one looks back, I won't take you through the detail, of all of the, of the principal roles that Canadians played in the shaping of so much of this architecture in this new era. And of course, what's happened now in the world by which we are still being shaped is that in 1989, there was another new world. A new world in that case uh, created by the fall of two walls. One of those walls I've referred to, and that was the dark, divisive Berlin Wall, which separated the Germanies, separated the world. But the other was a wall which none of us really knew about until it came down, until it was penetrated by the insurgent internet and caused people who had not known they had anything in common with others, any means to communicate with others, suddenly to be in an entirely different sphere. What are some of the differences between then and now? What are some of the factors that distinguish the world uh, of, of post-1990 and the world of post-1945? One is that conflict in this world today is based much less on ideology and much more on differences of culture, differences of religion, differences of, of identity, differences of tribe. A second factor is that power is shifting. Obviously, it's shifting among nations, inexorably away from the traditional West to countries like Brazil, India, China, Turkey, Indonesia, Russia. But also, and this is less remarked, there is a shift of power from nation states to non-state actors. In this modern world, an organization like Greenpeace has had more impact upon public policy than many of the member nations of the United Nations. The Gates Foundation is much more innovative than most governments are. Unfortunately, organized crime, a non-state actor, has become increasingly powerful. And of course, terrorism uh, has become a, an increasingly significant factor. It is interesting to me, I'm sure to Elizabeth, that when Canada sets its priorities now and looks at the non-state actors with whom we have to deal, we spend much more time on the bad guys, on terrorism and on crime, than we do upon helping the good guys the Oxfams, the NGOs, the other organizations who, if given the kind of support that we now automatically give to people who frighten us, uh, could, could make a profound difference in the world. Another reality we face today, Somebody accustomed to colds recognized I needed a glass of water. Thank you for that, uh, that applause. Another reality that we face today, and we've not quite determined how to come to terms with it, has been the steady erosion in this internet age, in this age where people want more control of their own decisions. The steady erosion of the authority of former bulwarks of order, whether those are churches or governments or banks or business, or to quote a phrase from a, a very troubling recent past, the idea of shock and awe of military power. I had the privilege as foreign minister to uh, attend, it was one of the most wonderful meetings I regularly attended, 
the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Annual Dialogue. Uh, the title gives away where it occurred. Uh, but this was uh, that small, that group of both large and small countries uh, were one of the first uh, portions of Asia, indeed were the first portion of Asia, to become interested in working with their colleagues. They were very national places, those countries. And ASEAN, partly because it uh, needed to establish its own a capacity knew that people had to come together. And they did, and they invited uh, uh, certain other nations in the world to be their dialogue partners, and Canada was. And I had the opportunity to visit on six separate occasions, uh, annual dialogue meetings, one in each of the capitals of the then uh, six member countries of uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So I decided that I would invite them to a special meeting in Canada. Uh, they were all going to be in Canada uh, for, uh, be in North America for the General Assembly of the United Nations. So I invited them to come to Jasper, to golf. Jasper happened to be in my constituency. Uh, invited them to come to Jasper to golf on Thanksgiving weekend in Canada. And of course, we got to Calgary and were ready to go to Jasper and to Alberta being Alberta at Thanksgiving. There was a terrible snowstorm. And it closed the airport at Jasper, where we were supposed to, at Hinton, where we were supposed to, uh, to land. So, uh, but of course, it being Alberta, uh, that terrible snowstorm affected every part of the province except the highway between Banff and Jasper in the Rocky Mountains. So we went up to Banff and we rented a Brewster bus. And we took the bus up uh, on our way to Jasper. Uh, with no problem at all until we hit the ice fields when suddenly there was a great burst of snow. And I was a little worried about some of my colleagues, one in particular. Uh, he was the foreign minister of uh, Brunei and his brother just happened to be the Sultan. <laughs> so I said to him, your Royal Highness, I suppose you've not been in a snowstorm before. And his then colleague, the late Ali Alatas, the foreign minister of Indonesia piped up and said, his Royal Highness has never been on a bus before. <laughs> now I raise that, I raise that because all of us have buses we've not been on before. We're accustomed to looking at the world through our own experience, often through our own prejudices and preconceptions. And that will no longer work in a world like this where there are so many intersections. Uh, we need to look beyond what confines us. We have to be open to the possibilities and the alliances that exist. We need help. Uh, and I've, I've listed some of the ways in which we may be able to, uh, uh, to do that. I should say that one of the, it's relatively easy to write a book, relatively easy, Elizabeth. Uh, it is often a lot harder uh, to get people to find a way in which they can actually act on the parts of your book with which they agree. And one of the reasons, among the reasons, a lesser reason I'm interested in being here tonight is that I think some of the suggestions and observations I put forward are in fact quite valuable. But I need a lot of help in determining how we might make them work. I need people to help me look at buses that none of us has been on before. And let me just talk about two or three of the, the elements I'm interested in. I think this factor of non-state actors is immensely important. Non-state actors, the good guys, not the bad guys, Non-state actors can make an immense difference. They already are. You go to any conflict zone in the world and you will find that many of the people who are making the most practical human difference are people who come from non-state organizations. And so it goes in so many other ways. But there is one thing that non-state actors can't do, and that is that they cannot change the rules within which they operate. The rules within which they operate are established by governments. That is state power. And yet states are very often unimaginative, or they're cumbersome, or the very good ideas of accountability mean that they, are be they become cautious when they face a, a crisis, they back away from it. 
So we have, here we have a situation with the people where the people who have authority are unwilling or unable to exercise it. And the people who have influence or capacity uh, do not have the authority to get things done. So we need, in other words, we have people with imagination and we have people with a mandate. And we need to find ways to marry mandate and imagination so this partnership can be made more fruitful. This is not as simple as it sounds from a podium. If you talk to many non-governmental organizations, they will say to you early on in the conversation, we are non-governmental for a reason. We're not going to work with those guys. And they have ample reason for suspicion. But nonetheless, if we are going to make the most of the opportunities that are open to us with this emerging uh, catalog of people who want to make a difference and have skills, we are going to have to find some way to bring these groups together. And I need some help in indicating how that can, might be done. One of the reasons Canada was able to be effective after the, first war, after the Second World War was that we entered into a number of alliances with other countries, alliances rather like us, alliances at least with countries with whom we had a lot in common. It was Louis Saint-Laurent, a uh, French-Canadian foreign minister at the time, who transformed, helped transform the, the, M, the British Empire into the British Commonwealth, and we became a very influential member of that, uh, of, of that organization. Um, we were, at, we were architects of NATO. We were extremely active in the United Nations, all of those things. In other words, recognizing that we had capacities of our own, but that the job was immense, we went out and drew in others who could help us together achieve those objectives. Well, many of those alliances are worth maintaining today, but we are in a new age, and what we have to do is build 21st century alliances. Uh, I don't mean formal organizations necessarily uh, like a new NATO. I mean instead a deliberate identification of other countries or indeed of non-state actors who share aspirations and views that we do and who recognize that if we work together, we can be more effective than we would be if we were on our own. Uh, countries, for example, who are good at managing conflict, as we are, who are good at bridging differences, as we are, as we are. Countries who are interested in multilateral approaches, as we are. I've listed a a list in my book of some of the countries we should be working at, uh, we should be looking at as potential alliances. Um, for example, the Nordics obviously should. Ghana, a country that has had successful elections on a continent uh, where those are not as common as they should be. Indonesia. Indonesia is particularly interesting. It is a huge country like ours, uh, one of the largest in the world. It has been active in international affairs for a long time, one of the founding members of the non-aligned movement uh, years ago. Uh, it has begun to develop an interest now in having an impact upon contemporary policy, and it has the largest Muslim population in the world. Well, we should be looking at ways, very substantial ways, in which we and they, we and some of the others, could work together. But how do we do that? How, as a practical matter, do we do that? And I, again, would appreciate your, your views on that. And the other theme I raise in the book is the theme of leading from beside. And that grew out of a conflict in the United States. Indeed, there was a disagreement about who should lead the attacks on Libya at that time, the action on Libya. And the British and the French offered to be the principal leaders from Western nations, uh, which made sense to everybody. The Americans were overextended uh, elsewhere. But some poor guy in the White House decided to describe that initiative as leading from behind. Well, you can imagine how the American Congress uh, responded to the idea that their country would lead from behind. What is really important here is to look at leading from beside. It's important in terms of being able to make use of these countries that are coming newly into influence and to prominence, but are not accustomed to working with one another. It's certainly important to a country like us, who before the phrase was thought of, were leading from beside. That is how we have done, accomplished so much of what we, uh, uh, we need to do. Uh, that is a way, that is, and that is, that is an area where we have very clear track records. Uh, I, 
always hesitate. I find it very difficult to ever say anything positive about Lloyd Axworthy because he and I sat on other sides of the, the house for so long. But Lloyd Axworthy was the minister who made it possible to bring together non-governmental organizations and governments, both on the International Criminal Court and also on the Landmines Treaty. We should be doing much more of that. And this concept of leading from beside is much more necessary. Again, I need help in knowing how we can make that work. I'm going to switch uh, emphasis slightly before I wind down. Um, uh, my credentials as foreign minister were that Mr. Mulroney appointed me to be the minister. I couldn't have got in if I'd written the exams. I don't know how many of you could have got in if you'd written the exams. <laughs> but it opened wonderful opportunities for me, and then it ended. And it ended because I was appointed, for, I was disappointed from foreign affairs, and I was appointed to be the Minister of Constitutional Affairs. As our daughter Catherine said, that change in our life could be summarized by saying, bye bye Paris, hello Moose Jaw. <laughs> and, And that led me again into an intense identification and visiting of my own country. Uh, I learned about our country more than I would have otherwise. Uh, one of the things Elizabeth will tell you is that there is that one of the great advantages or privileges of being a member of parliament is the opportunity it gives you to learn about other people uh, who share your country uh, but uh, with whom you are not as well acquainted as you should be. And it's very important for us to focus on these issues in the context of international policy because who we are at home determines what we can do and want to do in the, in the broader world. The headlines today are about counterterrorism. It's the top of the agenda today in the European Union. Uh, there's legislation coming back again in your House of Commons next week. I want to speak a little bit about that. This new generation of security issues is very important in itself. The threats are serious, and so will be Canada's response, which should be framed in the context of two defining qualities which we attribute to Canada. One relates to our form of democracy, and specifically Parliament's ability to hold the government accountable. The other is Canada's fundamental respect for difference. That respect for difference is at the heart of our federalism, which with all of its frustrations has been remarkably successful at home and which may offer pertinent guidance to other countries whose populations are not uniform but want to be united. And that respect for difference is also at the heart of our success as a society which manages diversity better than any other nation in the world because we genuinely respect differences. These, if I may say so, are particularly appropriate questions to consider in light of two notable anniversaries. We are meeting tonight barely a week after the 200th anniversary of the birth of Sir John A. Macdonald and nearly five months before the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. Sir John had his faults, of course, and they should be acknowledged and where possible repaired. But unlike the legendary Lincoln, he built and he brought together a huge and diverse country without a war and with a parliament populated by so-called loose fish MPs whose support had to be earned issue after issue and not taken for granted. And the principle of Magna Carta is precisely that governments must be accountable. Kings then, presidents and prime ministers now. I'm quite worried about our capacity to maintain this respect for difference that has become such 
a characteristic of Canada. I want to remind you of an error I made uh, in, the, in the, what we called uh, the Gulf War, the invasion of Kuwait. We had naturally, the Prime Minister and I as Foreign Minister, had naturally been condemning Saddam Hussein in the worst kind of language, calling him evil, evil Saddam Hussein. And I was called one day to a meeting of Canadian Arabs in downtown Toronto, a very angry meeting where parents said to me, Mr. Clark, have you any idea how many six-year-olds in the greater Toronto area are named Saddam Hussein and how they react when they hear their prime minister or their foreign minister use that name and describe it as evil? Kids that age are overwhelmingly self-reverential and damage was done that we can never repair. We tried to back away from that kind of language, but it was done. It's an indication of an innocent, by and large innocent, an unknowing act that had consequences. Well, let's fast forward to today. Acts of brutality in the name of Islam reflect neither the beliefs of that faith nor the behavior of the overwhelming majority of the world's Muslims. Yet it can affect their reputation and their ability, even in Canada, to be judged on their merit and common humanity. Now, no doubt, there are families in this room whose forebearers or whose faith were treated as outsiders or treated with suspicion. Part of our Canadian accomplishment is that we have actively built down those suspicions, those exclusions. It's never complete, but it is better here than elsewhere, and it is part of the promise of Canada. We need now in our daily lives to embrace, comfort, and respect and include Canadian Muslims and others who feel they are outsiders in our common country. <laughs> Decades ago, when Nazi persecution of Jews was not well enough known in the United Kingdom, the Council of Christians and Jews was created to, and I'm quoting from their description, check and combat religious and racial tolerance and promote mutual understanding and goodwill. That council became a leading force of tolerance and understanding in our own and in other countries. We need a similar force today, perhaps a council of Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Let, <clears throat> Let me speak briefly now of Parliament and accountability. I was privileged to serve in the House of Commons for 25 years, holding governments accountable and being held accountable, including being defeated on a budget vote. My regretful observation is that there has been a serious decline over decades in the capacity of government, of parliament, to hold governments accountable. Almost all of the so-called major reforms of parliament in that period were designed to make the business of government more efficient and had the effect of making accountability to parliament less effective. The capacity to control spending the elemental capacity of Parliament was sharply reduced in 1968 when time limits were placed on the debate of government estimates. Before that time, the only way an opposition could hold up a role the, the, a, a government was to deny, was to keep on questioning about spending. Time limits have stopped that and none of the substitutes has repaired that essential relationship. The dominance of the Prime Minister's office and the Privy Council office has accelerated steadily under governments of all stripes, limiting the authority of ministries, which used to be capable of making suggestions and offering observations freely of their own, and with a few exceptions of ministers. The practice of omnibus bills, where important legislation is rolled anonymously into a budget measure or some other measure, and there, there is little or I think in some cases no opportunity for Parliament 
uh, to discuss a matter that then becomes a law which has authority because it is an act of parliament. Well, how can it be an act of parliament if parliament had no opportunity to debate it or to stop it? But omnibus bills are now becoming... <laughs> omnibus bills are now becoming more and more part of the ordinary routine. And political parties, and I know there is a leader of a political party in the room, so I will be very careful about how I say this. <laughs> well, here, again, we're in agreement. <laughs> political parties have become instruments of discipline and of messaging, not sources or of core conduits of independent perspectives. The one major attempt at parliamentary reform that is an exception to this rule was, I'm happy to say, something we tried to do in 1979, and that was the introduction of the Access to Information Law. Now, why was that different? It was different because we had been in opposition. And the late Jed Baldwin of Peace River, who had been our House leader and was a very able lawyer, determined that, that oppositions would always be impoverished if they did not have access to information. And so we were in the process of devising that law uh, when our government fell. But it was such a compelling case that had been made, two things about it. One, it was such a compelling public case, a compelling public need, that the, success, the succeeding Trudeau government could not uh, avoid bringing in their own access to information law. But secondly, as I look back on it, even at that time, Many, if not most, of my cabinet colleagues and many, if not most, of our senior officials opposed the idea of an access to information law. And certainly, and I must say, access to information laws can be troublesome in their own right. Uh, they are not a miracle solution. But the principle of the public right to know so that parliaments can hold governments accountable is essential. The reality is we, Canada today is not keeping the promise of Magna Carta. This trend may be more active now, but it is not new, and it is a hard habit to break unless citizens, voters, break it. When the journalist Peter O'Neill read that I was speaking here, he asked, and I quote, should I read anything more into this than you doing what your publisher regularly urges you to do and go out and hawk your books? I told him, I don't expect to endorse any party in the next federal election. But I have a suggestion to voters. The role of political parties has changed materially in this age of robocalls and pollsters and pressure groups. As the power of party leaders grows, so does the temptation to erode the most basic principles of a parliamentary system, whose genius has always been that the elected parliament ultimately controls the government, not the other way around. <laughs> this would be heresy to most party leaders, but not to Elizabeth. But I suggest that in the next election, Canadians support the candidate who is more committed to Parliament than to party. And if that happens, <laughs> and if that happens, I think we can have, we can be on the way to a more successful uh, functioning of our parliament. Now, as I was reading uh, the advertisement for this event, I noted a piece that said that I was going to read from my book. Um, and I always follow instructions, particularly Elizabeth's instructions. So let me read briefly from my book, the opening words of my book. An essential question for citizens of lucky countries is not simply who we are, excuse me, 
or what we earn, but what we could be. That question implies others. To what do we aspire? What are our talents and advantages and assets? How can we be better than we have been in our impact on events both inside and outside our country? That is the spirit in which I wrote. That is the spirit in which those of you who have been kind enough to respond positively to my book have responded. That, I think, is a spirit that on international as on other issues, we have to safeguard as we move forward. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. As Lauren is on her way up here, I should tell you one of the tricks I learned in Parliament. Uh, je parle français comme quelqu'un de l'Alberta, which is to say I don't uh, speak it absolutely fluently. But whenever, as Prime Minister, I received a question that was too difficult to answer, I'd reply in French. Uh, <laughs> And so now that the tough part of this evening comes for me and you're going to ask questions, I'm suddenly going to lose my voice. <laughs> I guess uh, the questions are going to come from the microphone instead of written questions. Okay. I didn't want to leave Jill hanging here. Good uh, Lord, no. <laughs> <laughs> Here so or I anywhere, think, please. I think, the idea, <laughs> I think the idea of written questions has kind of fallen apart, has it? Oh, okay. If you have a question, you're supposed to write it on the piece of paper that is on your chairs, and it will be picked up. If you can just give us a couple to start with, that would be a great idea, because... I know we don't have a lot of time. The question is, what is the end game for Canada's uh, war in the Middle East? Uh, is it a new Hundred Years' War? Does Stephen Harper know where he's going? <laughs> I think the Middle East remains the most dangerous place in the world, uh, and the place uh, very much in need of constructive involvement by anyone who can help. It should be clear that Canada is not a principal influence in the, United, United, in the Middle East. Uh, we're not a neighbor as Europe is. Uh, we. Uh, and, the, and we are not a power, as others are. But nonetheless, we have in our history been able to find ways in which we could not only deal with explicit and difficult questions like the refugee question, but also served in ways that brought together uh, parties that are very seriously, uh, seriously divided. And we are not following that role uh, now quite deliberately. Mr. Baird has said uh, we are not neutrals here. We have a side. Well, there are enough people with sides in the Middle East, and what is needed is a capacity in the tradition that Canada followed under liberal and progressive conservative governments to find ways in which uh, common ground can be found. Do you want to read them? Okay. How would you describe the impact of the high level of partisanship, particularly on the part of the Conservative Party on Parliament? Do you notice that these questions sound much more poetic when she reads them than when I do? <laughs> I, think it's been a, I think it's a very bad period in Parliament, and I think there's a reason why the, the Conservative Party acts that way, and that is that they came to office as a very new party without really much experience uh, of the country or much experience of, how the, of the parliamentary system. Most of their views about parliament were negative. 
uh, they thought it, they thought government was bad. And uh, that reflected in their attitude toward the, uh, toward the institution. They tended to dismiss the conventions of, of parliament. Uh, people who are I inherently outsiders naturally and sometimes properly resent conventions. They did with regard to parliament. And that has meant that uh, a place that is always going to be acrimonious, but has in most cases in the past also been a place where harmony can be found is becoming uh, very seriously uh, acrimonious now where trust levels are low. Uh, Elizabeth would have more knowledge of this because she is in the place now and she is, is acting in a way that is uh, almost singular in its uh, determination to work with, uh, with others. But I think that is what is happening and that is why it is happening. Here's a tough one. The Ecological Rights Association submitted a proposal to you as chair of the Charlottetown Accord to enshrine ecological rights in the Constitution. Do you now wish that ecological rights had been enshrined in the Constitution? <laughs> I think the serious answer to that is that I think we have to be careful about the rights that we enshrine. But the other practical answer to that is that um, I was not alone in the Charlottetown uh, Accord. Uh, I was the chair and uh, trying to find uh, agreement. And there were, there were some difficult issues. I can't honestly say that was one because I think that there were some issues that were considered as more serious at the time than others were. Uh, but that is one on which it would have been very difficult to, uh, uh, to find that kind of agreement. I'm a parent of two teens who are concerned with injustices and don't see any way for help in our political situation. What concrete small steps would you give our youth to help bring a fairer, more involved democracy for them? They don't need parliament to become involved in, uh, in local activities and in uh, dealing with inequalities. Uh, and they don't need to confine their interest in that to those who are at, at home. They, there are abundant organizations that are doing that internationally. In many cases, that kind of involvement in non-governmental organizations, I think, is, is uh, highly instructive and, should, and people should be encouraged to do it, and many of them are. One of the real challenges with this issue is to find ways in which young people who are motivated or who are indeed involved can make a real and practical difference. We're all, many of you are acquainted, probably more than I am, with the, the WE organization. WE to WE. ME to WE, excuse me. You see, I'm not as closely associated with it as my spouse is uh, on so many other things. Um, but, and these are, uh, I've been in those audiences, and these are people with immense, an immense sense of, uh, of commitment, but there is always this question as what do we do next? Uh, how do we do these things? And I think that, that answer, the answer to that requires more attention than I'm able to, more consideration than I'm able to give to it, uh, to it now. But there is that interest and there are means. And uh, again, we have to find ways to marry them. Can a coalition government work? Yes is the answer. Um, <laughs> the larger answer is very personal. Um, we all, when we come to office, I guess particularly when we're 39 and we come to office, uh, think we know how systems work. Um, it never crossed my mind uh, to contemplate some kind of cooperation uh, with other parties in minority parliament. In fact, I foolishly said we will govern as though we have a majority. I did that because I thought I had to reassure people who had voted for me that we were going to be serious about following through on the matters uh, we had proposed. In retrospect, uh, there were opportunities there uh, to have made, if not a coalition government, at least agreements on particular issues with particular other parties in Parliament uh, that would, I think, have been uh, of great value to the country, not because it would have helped me govern, but because we were a new government and if I may say so myself, a fairly talented government uh, that, that was prepared to undertake changes that others in the country and the parliament would have wanted to do. But I was locked into my view of what does and doesn't work in, ca in Canada to the degree that I didn't pursue that option. And uh, while I skated around the question about uh, uh, rights in the charter, I think that I was wrong at that time and that uh, it would have been 
wise to have taken a look at what other options we could have uh, pursued at that time. We only have time for a few more because I know a lot of you want to say hello to Mr. Clark and Elizabeth and, and buy their books and they've had a long day. So the uh, three more questions. How do you feel Canada should handle the refugee crisis? As we have in the past, as we have in a quite accomplished past. Uh, I was speaking to the Mennonite Central Committee in uh, Calgary the other day and uh, r reminded them of the reminded us all of the extraordinary efforts uh, to which Canadians which, uh, that Canadians undertook uh, in the case of a number of these international crises. Certainly, uh, in uh, East Africa, Mr. Trudeau bringing uh, so many opening the doors of Canada. Certainly, in my case, in the response in my case in the gov in the in the period of time when I was uh, was Prime Minister of Canada's response to uh, the boat people. Uh, which was extraordinary, so extraordinary it, it won the country, the Nansen uh, Medal, for the first time it's ever been awarded to a country. That's our tradition. We're a country of immigrants. I was going to say to Elizabeth earlier, and then I decided I'd, there's no need to do that, that um, uh, her family moved late to Cape Breton. Uh, my family came early to Cape Breton, three or four hundred years ahead of yours, Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> that is to where immigrants our, immigra our immigrating family came, and we are all immigrants, and we also have space, and we know the, the uh, and, and we, are all, we are all people, many of the people who came as immigrants then, under today's definitions, would be refugees. So we have to be a country that is, is prepared to open <laughs> our minds to those issues. Canada used to be respected in rooms where climate change was on the agenda, was the topic, and now we're the laughing stock. What can be done about that, Mr. Clark? Well, thank you for that question, because I think, in fact, a lot can be done. Uh, I think there is a quite interesting confluence of, uh, of circumstances in Canada. Um, for one thing, I think that uh, many corporate attitudes, whether by choice or by a recognition of necessity, have, uh, have changed from what they were in earlier times. And there certainly are, is a willingness to talk about some of those issues in a fulsome way that did not exist before. Uh, secondly, there is, um, uh, there is the new and very important aspect of uh, the Aboriginal people, of our First Nations. And there are two aspects of that to which I, I want to refer. Uh, the one we tend to focus on is that they now have rights, and they have rights unquestionably, and that has changed the equation. And the most recent Supreme Court decisions have reaffirmed those rights. But in addition to rights, Aboriginal people on sustainability questions have always had values. The relation between the people and the land is perhaps the most essential element of Aboriginal thinking and Aboriginal tradition. And we're in a time now where if there are serious attempts by people who are now in an adversarial role, one against the other, on these questions, if there, is a, or if there are serious attempts to find common ground, I think there is in fact more possibility uh, for that to move forward uh, than on the other. There are some challenges here for the environmental movement, which is like every other movement in that it has, there are differing degrees of commitment or differing degrees, to use another word, of zeal. And there are going to have to be, if there is a serious interest in trying to find uh, common ground, there is going to have to be, as there was in my negotiations with the Aboriginal people in Charlottetown, there, is going to have to be, there are going to have to be a series of very difficult decisions. Where can we move forward? Where, where will our move uh, cause others to respond? Uh, I think that the environmental movement, as I understand it, is itself mature enough and broad-minded enough that most of its members will want to engage in that, uh, that exercise. And my own view is, and I, I don't think I am simply uh, optimistic here, my own view is uh, that there, is, there are solid reasons to believe, environmental reasons, corporate reasons, Aboriginal reasons, uh, that we can make more progress on these issues uh, than we have at any time. Remember that Canada won our respect in international circles because of what our leaders did. In, in many of those cases. 
And what is really necessary now, and it's grown, is there has to be, uh, the, the, the issue now is going to be what our people will do, uh, what our communities will support. And I think, again, there is a growing understanding that these issues uh, cannot be avoided. So I think there is an opportunity uh, uh, here on these issues. It takes people of courage and of vision, uh, such as your member of parliament, uh, to play an active role in that. She will have to be tough with some of her own friends. We all have to do that uh, from time to time. Uh, but uh, there is no doubt in my mind that if we can find the will on this issue, we can find a way not only to restore our own reputation, but in fact to have an influence, a constructive influence on the attitudes of other countries and governments. That seemed to me to be a summary answer, a way to wind up the evening. The next question was about the Ukraine, but I think I'd, I'd like to suggest we ended on that uplifting comment about what we can do as people interested in climate change and the environment and, and with our interest in the Green Party and what it is striving to do. Um, Mr. Clark, you quoted an Aboriginal chief that said, we must lift each other up, and I definitely felt lifted up by your address tonight. But Elizabeth is going to give the formal thank you and present a gift on behalf of those people who were here tonight. Thank you again. So, since I, since it falls to me, my lucky role to give some thank yous, I, before I thank the Right Honourable Joe Clark, I wanted to thank again the wonderful people who have volunteered to, stood up, to stand up with me, not just in my nonpartisan role as your Member of Parliament, but to work so hard for me with my partisan hat on as leader of the Green Party and having a lot of challenges. So I just want to thank everybody, Jocelyn Gifford, Marilyn Redivo, Dave Charles, who serves as the chair of the executive of our Saanich Gulf Islands Green Party. This whole idea of having a distinguished lecturer series was Don Scott's idea, and he serves on the Federal Council. If I go through Terry Haig, if I go through thanking everyone, this will be too long. I won't do that. Adam says no. I just wanted to make sure I also thank very much my dear friend, Lorna Crozier. If I'm her politician, she's my poet. And, <laughs> and so a lot of you will know you bought tickets to come here in November, and that it was planned for the day that became my dad's funeral. And I don't want to get all emotional. I just, it meant so much to me that this, this incredible man, with all he's accomplished internationally, that he found time at all ever to say that he'd come to Sydney and speak at an event sponsored by a political party for which he's not yet a member. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, any time. Uh, that, that, you know, I, uh, Joe Clark and Maureen McTeer wrote me a note and said, you can't possibly go ahead with the event with you going to the funeral. That was my first thought. Oh, we can't cancel the event. We can't move the event. I'll just go home for the funeral to Cape Breton, and then I'll come home to Sydney afterwards, and I'll have missed it. But Lorna can cover for me, and it'll all be fine. I mean, it was a, it was a foolish idea. And the care and compassion and friendship and deep humanity of Maureen and Joe to say, don't worry, we'll come back another time. We don't want to be respectful for the loss you've had in your family. So there's a lot of ways in which I'll never be able to thank uh, the Right Honorable Joe Clark and the extraordinary Maureen McTeer ever enough for everything, including having Catherine, who I am my door. But anyway, I'm going to stop talking now and give Joe Clark and Maureen this, which, by the way, is made from recycled plate glass through a very clever process by local artist Rick Silas. So this would have ordinarily ended up in a landfill, and instead, it's a work of art and a thing of beauty forever, just like you. 